So, um, you know, we talked about these meetings. I really wanted to be very casual, but I'd really like to talk about archery stuff too, like actual shooting technique. And um, I think in the in the future, I'll I'll bring up some subjects or or uh, have some photos and videos and stuff that we can actually talk about. I have a couple of things that had come up for me as a coach this week. Maybe you guys will have some stuff too. Um, I really want to talk about coaching, but I did get uh, questions from a few people. Turn off my heater because it's making noise. Um, but just about the coaching program and structure. One was uh, about mentoring. If any of you are asked to be a mentor on uh, for any of our coaches doing the new session coach course, um, uh, I guess there's some questions around that. And I know part of the pro problem will be that the program is uh, a bit different than, than the old level one. So it, it would help if you're going to be a mentor that you understand the empowering um, archery. Uh, if you've taken one of those courses, you don't have to have done it. Um, uh, we also do the technical framework, um, might be some new stuff. But the, the new session coach, a whole lot of it is around, we're not just trying to teach coaches the one thing. In other words, do it just this way. Just, you know, a beginner's course has to be done one way. But we're trying to get them to think about how to always make it better, how to evaluate, how to, you know, change things, you know, come up with new ideas. Um, instead of just doing the same thing all the time. Um, and then also the the empowering archery module, which is um, if you if you haven't done that yet, it's a really great course. It, and what it does, it looks at, you know, the theory and, and practice and what academics tell us about what motivates people to want to participate in any activity, but especially in sport and you know how you as a coach can um, create an environment that is empowering for the individual and we talk about the ABCs which is autonomy belonging and competence and and uh, having a task focus versus a uh, um, the superiority focus and there's you know things like that 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 really should give people a more enjoyable experience and uh, and better motivation to want to participate in our sport and that's what the empowering archery thing is all about and we've separated that into two parts there's a part one and a part two or you can take them together um, as for the entire course right now for the for the level one session coaches uh just part one is required and then for the development coaches later on it'll be um the the second part or the whole thing will be be required for that um but it's but they are open to anybody, anybody that wants to, to do them. And we've called it empowering archery rather than it, it comes from the empowering coaching program from the University of Birmingham. But we've modified it to include not just for coaches, but for anybody involved in their club development or working with, uh, um, you know, in the committees. And because we really see it as a way to to motivate people to be involved in the sport in whatever way they're involved in the sport so it's just something something to think about so if if you're going to be you know if you are asked to mentor one of the things we eventually will do some mentor training if you go on the learning curve you should all have access to the learning curve um and if you don't email me and we'll work on making sure you can get that uh but there is a section under coaching science and then there's a card about mentoring it talks about uh what a mentor's role is and i think one of the important things to remember as a mentor is it is that you're not actually there to pass on knowledge in other words to tell your mentee what you know or how to do something but you're actually there to kind of listen in fact if you can a good mentor will never give their mentee an answer um because that's not really what a mentor does a mentor will kind of guide them or lead them to discover the answers themselves. Does that make sense? So, and it, so, so you don't necessarily need to know what they're learning, but you just need to be able to listen and guide, but also make sure that they get a chance to practice what they're learning um, within their club environment so that they can get uh, 
um, you know, get some practice, you know, very much being a good coach is really about just like an archer has to practice to become a good archer. A coach needs to practice their coaching to become a good coach and just getting that experience of being out in front of people and working with people and trying things and thinking about it. And if it works or it doesn't work. Um, so anyway, that's what that, that the, the mentoring is all about. If you're, if you're going to mentor somebody within the new course, um, was there, was there other questions that, that were sent to me? I, I put notes here, but I can't, <laughs> I can't figure out what I, what I wrote down. I think I covered it because I think somebody asked something about empowering archery and the other was about uh, mentoring and feedback. Any questions on that? You OK. Um, and then I guess. Uh, I, I really I don't want to just run these meetings. I want you guys to be part of it. So if you, you can, I don't think you necessarily need to mute yourselves unless you have. Uh, um, some kind of noise in the background that's going to cause problems. But um, does anybody have anything they want to talk about and discuss? I have a few things just in case you all don't come up with something. Like anything that's come up with working with archers that you've been working with, or if you have questions about the program, that's fine too. I have a question. Okay. Right. Um, it's basically, I was just wondering, after people have done the beginners course what what's your views on them getting their own kit do you think it's a good idea for them to continue using um the club's bows and or do you think it should be right you've done your beginners course if you want to carry on now you've got to here you are here's your local shop you've got to go down and buy your own stuff do you think there's any advantage in them actually having their own or are they OK to carry on and just use the beginners? Um, I think it, it could go both ways. I think it just depends on the situation and talking to the individual. I mean, I would just let them know that, you know, it's your choice. If you want to continue to use the club equipment, that's great. It'll give you more time to get settled in your form and more time to to. Uh, look at other people's bows, see what other people are shooting, or maybe even try some other bows. Um, you know, the, I don't I don't think I would, I wouldn't rush them into getting their own equipment, but I certainly, you know, if somebody says, you know, somebody that's got the money to, to spend and they want to get equipment, I would, I would welcome them to do that as well and help them uh, get the right equipment. But I think I'd make sure they understood though, when you buy equipment that early, that you really want to buy more basic equipment. In other words, don't go out and buy the top of the line, you just, especially because it'll just be too heavy. The mass weight will be too heavy. The draw weight will probably be too heavy. You know, you actually need to start with kind of beginner intermediate equipment, maybe for that for next six months after beginner's course. So so don't go, you know, yeah, the reason nuts and get the top of the line stuff. But uh, the reason I, I was choice. thinking, the reason I was thinking about it, it was because like when we did the um, the Monday natters and it was like uh, what women want and everything. One of the reasons that they put was possibly with ladies, they sort of feel a bit guilty about it. Said about like um, giving up the time um, instead of looking after the family, and also about the expense of things. And I'm sort of thinking, well. You pay out your 40 or 60 pound for your um, beginner's course. And then, well, in our club, basically it's, well, now you've done it. If you want to continue, you've got to join. So therefore you've got your archery GB plus whatever the club charges. Some people, it's just like a lump sum, isn't it? And others do a smaller amount and then um, fees every time every every time you shoot which i think is fairer really but um also then if you've got to add on sort of 150 to 200 pound for a kit and i'm thinking well they've only had 12 hours it's an awful lot of money to invest after possibly shooting for a maximum of 12 hours 
Yeah, that's why I say it just totally depends on the individual. I mean, if you get somebody that's got the money to burn, don't stop them from getting the kit. But if it is somebody who's, you know, they're they're it it's kind of a, it is an expensive sport, um, unfortunately. But if you got somebody that that really can't afford the equipment and the club has equipment that they can use, I would tell them it's absolutely fine to continue the to use the club equipment. And there might even be advantages to continuing to use the club equipment because you can really work more on the development of good, correct technique and, you know, see how you enjoy it and see what other people are using. But if somebody's got the money and wants to buy their own bow, I think it, that's great, too, for them. So it just it totally depends on the circumstance. I don't think it's black and white or one way or the other. No, no we had... Sorry. No, I was going to say, in our club... What we yeah. do is a bit like what Lloyd said, you know, if you, you're going to get those people who straight away, yeah, I love this, right, I'm going to go and spend 500 quid on a, a bow. But we also, in our area, like probably a lot of others, we have areas where people aren't, um, you know, fortunate to have money. So what we do is we hire. We do a £10 a month hire for the bow. They get that bow for as long as they need it until they can afford because we don't want to put people off not yeah. actually joining the club. So that, that's what we do. That's ideal. See, yes. just help them with what you can. Uh, we do that with our bows. We've got like a, a competition kit and they can take the whole competition kit to competitions. It'll, it's um, one of the intermediate kits from Quicks and they can actually get into a competition with it. It's, it's good enough for that, so that, that works out quite well. And like Mandy said, we hire that out. Yeah. So, and it goes to buy more, either more kit or keep update the kit that we've got. I think one thing I'd really watch out for is is uh, parents buying their kids top of the line stuff, especially stabilizers, full sets, and it's just too heavy and it just absolutely destroys their their technique and probably their future potential because they've just got way too much bow. And, uh, but, but if the parents have the money to spend on it, then they, they go crazy. But yeah, if you've got, you know, like they're saying, a couple of clubs have uh, bow programs where they can help the archers with equipment. Um, sounds great. Like an intermediate type equipment to go that they can actually get into competitions if that's what they're interested in. It sounds when good. You when you hire out the bows, do you actually allow them to take them home with you, or is it just it's got to stay on, on the you know every they have them for the session and then they put them back with like all the other club equipment? With our with our club before COVID, um, we would allocate a suitable bow for that person, let them know what the number was, and then each time they come to the club, that was their bow. Yeah. COVID. What we've been doing is for beginners, they put a deposit down on the bow, which is probably 30 or 40 pounds. And then they take the bow and the arrows and everything else home with them um, and pay 10 pound a month still. But once they return the bow back, they get their deposit back just so then they know that it's their kit and it's they're responsible for it because you can't share it. Yeah, thanks. We do the same. We uh, have a deposit scheme, um, bow loan, and people just pay a deposit, and then when they, they get that back, when they return the bow. That's great. That sounds like a great way to do it. That way they can have decent equipment and then have something that feels like like it's theirs to use. Lloyd, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, it may already be out there, I don't know. Is there anything in Archery GB with coaching to coach mentally ill and disabled people? Because the reason why I'm asking is I'm about to set up a club in a school which is for mentally handicapped children. Um, and I'm trying, I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I can deal with people with the mental health because that's what I do. But I'm just wondering if Archery GB at some point might actually do a course specifically for coaches of how to um, coach and deal with um, children and adults with mental health and disabilities. 
Um, we have done uh, some courses for uh, people with disabilities, and we we even have a we we do have a workshop that we can do for people with disabilities. Um, I'm not sure how much it covers of uh, uh, people with mental health disabilities or or not. I used to do back in uh, California. I worked with quite a few different when I was working for Easton in in the youth programs. I did quite a few. Um, different kinds of groups with uh, either people with severe physical disabilities. And then also there's another another one called Project Interdependence, which was which was uh, different. A lot of learning disabilities and stuff. And, I, you know, I think if you just use regular coaching skills and creative coaching skills, I think it does help to know some of the tricks, like how do you get somebody that has this to be able to shoot? You know, and you can get some tips and tricks on that. Um, you know, we did that workshop where we had the guy from France come over and he just had all kinds of a bag of tricks of things that weren't expensive that could be adaptable to get almost anybody the ability to shoot. But, you know, I think as a coach, it's just it's just like coaching anybody else. You just figure out what they can do and where they need help. And uh, then then you go with it. I remember working with these one group of kids and they were severe learning disabilities and and uh, like very dyslexic type, but really extreme. And they would just keep going up and have the bow backwards, the arrow backwards. And they just it was so it, it was. But you just work with them just like you would anybody else, um, you know, I, and and make sure they're having a good time. But it is oh, just yeah. being creative. But you know, if you if you're if you're doing that, you get a lot of experience at. And you'll you'll come up with, you know, a lot of good answers to the challenges yourself. Then um, then you could become our our expert on that and, and do some. Uh, do some workshops for people because I think anybody that's had a, a lot of experience with that could then, you know, share some of their experiences and, and some of the creative solutions that they were able to come up with. Um, it is it is a lot of fun. I, I love the the challenge and then also just seeing the looks on the kids' faces when they when well, they're that's, successful. That's exactly why I'm doing it and why we're setting it up. And I've got a meeting tomorrow with the actual um, heads of the school and stuff. And it's a complete new entity. And I think te going in and teaching this is going to be good for the children. And I can't wait to see their faces when they have bow and arrows in their hands. Um, and also for me, it's completely pushing me out my comfort zone to actually do it. So I will keep you informed of how it all goes. Yeah, I also did. I mean, when we, when I worked in, in Los Angeles and we, we had a group of, of very kids with a lot of different disabilities and stuff. I was, I was able to get enough just local volunteer archers to come out and help where we were one-on-one -on -one with the individuals. Cause that's one of the things you, a lot of times you can't, you can't do a big group like you normally would, or even 10 or 12. Sometimes you almost need to, to do one-on-one, -on -one, but it wasn't hard to find a lot of people to come out and help and volunteer. And uh, you know, we got them all shooting. There's, well, there's always a way. That's one thing I love about our sport is you can you can you can be very creative and get anybody to shoot in one way or another. Special Olympics organization is a good one to use. Yeah. As well, uh, I did a lot of fundraising for Special Olympics in Chicago and and London. So, um, but a lot is not on it. No, I know. Because <laughs> I've, I've already been, asked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, I've been fighting for that one a fair few months now to try and get them to include archery on the Olympics, uh, but it's battling it's battling against them because they're a bit worried about the the um, the safety aspect on it on some on some of the uh, which I think is very discriminatory. But we won't go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it's possibly worth Mandy having a chat with them as well if two people can have a go at them. Um, and I've sent you an, a little tag on the chat box. I've got the handbook for adaptive archery from USA Archery as well. So. Yeah, there are some good resources out there. The the French book, which we have quite a few copies in the office. Well, when we had an office, um, <laughs> I don't know where they. They're probably they're they're stuck in a warehouse somewhere. Um, and uh, and and also there is some a, a 
play something on the learning curve, which has some stuff too. But you know, the learning curve is something where we we want coaches to to participate. And if you you know come up with if you have ideas or you have you know something that that's working for you, it you can uh, put that on the learning curve, and you can put it on your own file or within your own group or within your own club or whatever. And then if you want to ask us if it's something we could use within um, for everybody to share, we can bring that in and, and post it and share for everybody. So, you know, that's what the learning curve is for. It's to create, you know, that community so that we can share things and then we can discuss them, you know, with your peers and, and uh, hopefully build, you know, bigger and better information for everybody and learning for everybody. Let me, uh, I, there's a couple of questions in the text box I think I should probably answer. Um, there was one about uh, the empowering uh, archery level, the part one and part two. Um, you you could do, part two, it wouldn't hurt you to do both part one and part two. There's, um, if, if you've already booked for it, <coughs> it will be required for the development code. So, because we're in a modular system, if you took both of those, then you wouldn't have to take them when you when you went to the level two development coach. So, but it's up to you if you want to, you know, just do the one or do do both of them. Um, we are going to do. We are working on. We're trying to get the the uh, level one session coach completely wrapped up and done. We keep making changes and have to kind of redo some stuff, but. Um, we are going to hope, hopefully have the development coach. I'm actually really looking forward to getting that up and online uh, as soon as possible too. But, you know, it's just thinking about one of the things really challenging about this course is that we tried really, really hard to make the coach, the courses very hands-on and interactive and, you know, really involve the participants rather than just sitting in a PowerPoint presentation. But going online takes that away from us. You know, how can we do... So can we do a, f a full module on equipment setup and tuning online where we'd set up a program that was, you know, the equipment where you actually went out and, you know, set up a bow and, you know, did the limb alignment, did the center shot, did the bear shaft tuning and everything else, you know, that hands-on experience. So it's really hard to go backwards from that when we decided that that's, that's the direction we want to go. But you know, we are looking at and thinking about what else we can do online and whether there will be good learning. I think part of it, maybe with the, the equipment thing, we might talk about some things for two hours on a session and then ask people to do it, go out and practice it and and maybe take some pictures to show us, you know, what they've done before the next session. But it's just trying to find out how we can make it um, uh, more interactive and uh and, and interesting, I think, for the learner and make sure that there's there's going to be good learning there. You know, I think hands on doing is the best learning there is. Uh, just listening and watching slides is, is a little bit less. Let's see if there's other questions here. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, with the new levels, um, I don't know if we're going to do any county coaches. I mean, I, I, things are moving a little bit slow here, especially with the changes and with COVID. But the uh, and me being on furlough for almost all the last year, um, I, I'm really excited looking for going into the the next program level coach, which would be the the level three. And when we get to that point, we won't really need um, uh, a county coach anymore, uh, and that'll be the the, the program coach will be allow coaches to to specialize more in the area that they're going to be working in. Um, uh, we are uh, letting the senior coaches are putting together a senior coach course. Um, we we just have a few things that we want to make sure that they cover in that as as well. But they are putting together a senior coach course, which we're going to let go ahead because uh, we we don't have you know, and not any uh, a, a course at that level planned yet as we're we're trying to make go through these changes. Um, let me see. 
Yeah, USA Archery also had some really, really good videos on adaptive archery, and uh, I think we, I think we put those up on our, on the learning curve, I think, or we put links to them. Um, they, they got some funding, some outside funding to do the videos, so they're really well done and well produced. And uh, although I think you know we could we could do some good stuff too. We have you know our Paralympic. Uh, uh, squad is one of the best in the world so uh, and the coaches and and people that work there um, do some pretty awesome stuff so we could also get them involved in helping out <laughs> the uh, the chat box keeps moving on me here let's see is there anything else I miss here oh UK coaching course mental health awareness for sport and physical activity that sounds good. So there's definitely, you know, there's tons of outside resources and we talk about those all the time and, and it'd be, I, I think eventually it'd be great if we could actually put a list of all those types of courses together. Um, Cause there are some, there's a lot of good things out there. You know, I don't think we have to try to do everything because there is so much uh, good information out there for, for coaches in other places as well. So that sounds pretty good. UK coaching. Um, that might be a good course. Who who took that? Um, says man, a few of us have done this. Who t who took that course? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Was it good? I uh, yeah, I actually did it because I'm a member of um, UK Coaching anyway, yeah. and they they do offer some great courses regarding because it's all based around sport and mental health and disability, and you can do it online. It's very um, informative. Um, you do it at your own pace. Um, I think they did offer it for free, but there might now be a charge on it of, I think they're doing about £20 on them, or it might still be free. But I would definitely recommend it for people to do. Um, you, you answer questions and you have like a little case study to do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really good to do. So anything like that. Um, you've also got... Um, some stuff with Future Learn. They do some interesting courses for sporting and disability. So Future Learn is a good place to go, and a lot of their courses are free. That's good. If you guys have ideas, I think maybe we could put up a place on Learning Curve to for to uh, recommend courses from other places that that we might be able to tap into for people. Might be. A, a good way to do that, both free and maybe some paid ones. But that uh, 24 pounds a year isn't too bad for the UK coaching. You get a lot of of uh, benefits there and things that you can you can use. Uh, you might be able to talk your club into paying for that for you. You never know. Um, you can get separate insurance as well for archery through UK coaching. Yeah. Um, but that costs about £80 a year, but that covers you for £10 million public liability. Anyone who's teaching archery in areas that's not covered by Archery GB. Somebody's talking about uh, coaches with experience of working with kids with autism. That'd be interesting. I had a kid who had Tourette's. And what's really interesting is it, 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 you would see you'd see him have twitching and stuff in between shots, but he wouldn't when he shot. And his therapist was actually really interested in that and thinking that archery was was actually really helping him quite a bit. That that and he actually was a national champion in, in his age group in the United States. So and uh, so it's really quite a, quite interesting that there was there's something there that actually was very very archery was very beneficial. Yeah. Uh, for him, I've had experience of that. With uh, I do archery in a, a school for disadvantaged kids and stuff like that, uh, and they, the teachers say it's an amazing change in the afternoon. After you've done a morning's archery, in the afternoon they're absolutely different kids. And one of the teachers wanted to do an hour every morning. <laughs> Great. But, yeah, I can try and get a, one of the teachers to write something up if you want for that. The, uh, what, how, it, how it changes their attitude and everything. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there's some some great you know benefits there. I think that we could we could do more with our sport and that type of thing. Uh, Nick, an archery used to be part of the um, GCSE syllabus, and they've now dropped it, and uh, it's such a shame because, as you say. It's such a focus for a lot of children. Those who don't like or don't take part in team sports seem to take to archery very well. And I'm just, based yeah, on what you yeah. said, I'm just wondering, Lloyd, what can we do to try and get it back on the syllabus? Um, I, I think it's because a lot of schools didn't bother taking it up. And this, that's why they dropped it. Uh, that could be because, again, it's a chicken and egg thing. They, they don't take it up because yeah. a lot of them don't know it exists. And two, um, it's not pub sorry, it's not publicised. It's not pushed in schools. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think there was something one of the schools said about having outside coaches coming in and teaching a PE lesson, and um, or getting the te getting the teacher, the PE teacher trained up for archery. Um, and it was like it's just something else that we have to do that we don't really want to do. The, the actual reason that was given for dropping archery off the um, GCSE sport curriculum was because they classed it as elitism. That was the official line. Well, that is really strange because the only way to break the elitism is to encourage more people to do it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. that was, that was the official that. reason they dropped it. Oh, that's ridiculous. Sorry. I actually that's think uh, there was somebody trying to work on getting it back on the GCSE um, but I think, you know, if we got anybody that's within that system that are members that could 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 help, that would certainly uh, be a good thing to do. Well, I, uh, I, I teach at several schools and I think the more of us who can argue the point or push it, I think we can break this thing about it being elitism and, yeah. and get it started. Because unless somebody's up to make the change, it's never going to happen. <clears throat> You're right. Yeah, so we've just. Moved in, moved our archery club into uh, a school sports hall uh, uh, away from a council sports hall, um, and the school there were like, "Well, we could, we'll reduce your rent um, if you run an afternoon after after school club for the for the kids." Yeah, that's brilliant. So um, hopefully that will come off, and we could have two. We've got two schools then local that will be doing archery and. Okay, that's something that I'm hopefully getting paid for as well. <laughs> yeah, I saw uh, there was a raised hand there, Ben Ledwig. I think did you have something to say or hardened? No, Lloyd, that was done. She jumped in, Nick jumped in, and um, oh. stole, my, stole my sunshine. Okay, <laughs> sorry, mate. I just I saw, I saw it pop up here. <laughs> that was when you married to a, your head coach, it just kills you. <laughs> some good ideas here. We just have to think about how to move some of them forward. And uh, the Archer GB staff right now is really cut way back and busy with a lot of things. And and I think if there's anybody that's really a specialist in that area that could that could help out, and uh, then we can see if it also fits within a role. I know I think it was Gail Pink was working a little bit on that a while back, or not sure. But somebody, I know there was some discussion about trying to work with the uh, getting it back in GCSE and some other stuff. But it, a lot of these are really good ideas. Um, just got to figure out how we can how we can move them forward. It just needs somebody to, to yeah. take on the project. Can I just We had, um, what a fortunate for us, one of our members is actually a teacher. Um, she stopped out of archery for a while and she came back in. And at her school, she works with a lot of dis disadvantaged young people. So she put it upon herself to set up a she had to do set up a program and basically show a head head teacher how it actually is going to work. So obviously they they got a little bit of funding and used the youth club. They came down in the uh, black part of the day. They used it as part of the curriculum, and uh, they actually done some homework for it. And throughout that time, our secretary helped out. He was a bit reluctant at first, but he helped out. And he saw every session they'd done, he saw the actual change in the young people. He had one girl would never talk. 
by the end of four weeks, um, she was talking. And that was so powerful. Um, unfortunately, because of funding run out, they haven't they didn't continue. Had they yeah. continued with it, that would have been a role model to roll out for everybody else. And um, so it, it could be good that if you have a teacher that's really up there and interested in our career and want to put it in their school, they've got to put a program together, submit it to the head, but also involve the club in with it as well so that they can use their facilities um, rather than doing it at the school. Because some people, because at the school, they haven't got the time to allocate that space. So if those that uh, do things at a school don't automatically think that you're going to get that space because the first thing in the school's head is how am I going to make money out of that gym when football comes first? Yeah, well, I think I think it, it would help a school a lot if they had one, if they had the curriculum surrounding the archery. In other words, if it was a package deal that was easy for them. I think one of the biggest barriers is the cost of and maintenance and of everything of all the equipment that 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 is tough it is kind of expensive and you know compared to just throwing a football out in the field and letting them run around chasing that um the archery does it does take a lot um but like say yeah if a local club could help out or provide that that could help you know the the national archery schools in the schools program in the united states i don't know if you're aware of that but that of course that was headed up by matthews and when they brought out the genesis bow um, but it's a big program, and they've even had now had some Olympic team archers uh, that have come out of the National Archery in the Schools program starting out. But that just started out in in one state in Kentucky, and then it's grown grown quite a bit. But what's interesting about their curriculum is that they they only do two weeks um, in the schools, and one of the things that they were able to show early on is that the attendance, the school attendance. Was, was much higher during the two weeks that they were doing archery than the rest of the time. So um, that was a good selling point. But the other thing that was really interesting is that they, during that two weeks that they were doing archery during the PE class, they had also done archery-based curriculum in the history classes, because you think about how much history is with the bow and arrow. And in math and physics, you think about what, you know, there is there. And you know, so they're able to 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 put it throughout the whole school, kind of a, a curriculum around um, their the two weeks of archery, which was was kind of interesting. So it's a it's it was a good package, but it's definitely something to think about. Let me. Uh, I have Eddie. Eddie has his hand raised here. Uh, no, that, that, I, I've got I've got another one of Lloyd. I've got a question for you. Um, James, I've got my hand raised there again. Um, we haven't talk, really talked too much about art at the minute and technique and stuff, but what do you think uh, the, as years have gone by, technique has slightly changed? Um, where do you think the technique will, how, no, how will it look like in years to come? Because obviously now we're getting very technical. A lot of, um, you've got the uh, Mantis 8 that can do a few things, do graphs and everything. Um, where do you think it's going to go? The coaches. <laughs> where it's going to go is a good question. Um, I mean, I've definitely seen the evolution of technique, and it's really funny to see some things uh, that come back around every so often. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go. I definitely see that where, you know, there's, there's been big changes. A lot of it driven by, you know, whether Koreans and their learning. But things like the posture and and better understanding of alignment and and execution, I think, you know, and, and body position and stuff. But um, I don't I don't know where it's going to go after that. Um, it's kind of it's an interesting thing to think about. I wish I knew. What what'll <laughs> when be the you, next? When you come up with the answer, let us know. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a good thing to think about. Let's see, I had Eddie's got his hand up, and then I think K.S. Burton and somebody with a G.H. there. Oh, Graham Hadfield. Okay, let's start with Eddie. No, no, I've blown my hand now. I've answered, oh, okay. it, you've answered it for me. K.S. Burton? Graham go. Yeah, let Graham go. Yeah, Lloyd, back to um, schools. You mentioned that it's 
can cost of quite a bit to maintain the equipment. What I actually do with the children when they get to a certain age is teach them how to maintain the stuff. So fletching, uh, not repairing strings, but just little things so that uh, it helps, one, their learning, and two, reduce the cost. Now, archery equipment, uh, when you think about other sports, has got a very long life. Bosses do not wear out. Arrows may get a bit of ding in them, but they do last a long time because the sessions are only once or twice a week. The child's not going to do much damage to the equipment. And I think from that stance, um, someone mentioned that we funding is difficult. I think, again, if as an organisation, we reach out to local councils and get some help because there is money out there. I mean, I don't get any of it, but I know there's money out there, Lloyd. And what we need to do collectively is go out, get some of the funding, buy equipment, and that will last for ages. Kids are quite happy to flex. Kids are quite happy to learn how to put on knocks. It's all part of the experience. Um, it's added skills for them. And we as coaches and teachers are in the ideal position to give it to them. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an awesome sport for for the schools if we can get it in there. Um, Graham Hadfield, you had your hand up there. Yes, Lloyd. I was just going back to the the question of who do we actually contact with to get this perhaps back put back on the syllabus. I think possibly the the individual county education officers would probably be a good stop to go to first to see which schools and which what areas of schools we could go into. Um, it's it's a starting point rather than because you could, if you're going to put it back into the syllabus, you've got to go through the steps. And the only people that can put it back through the into the syllabus is an education committee, which probably starts uh, will end up going through Parliament knowing what's going on at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, let me, I'll look into that because there was somebody I thought that was working on it because I know, yeah. It was, I think it was Gail Ping because I've yeah. talked about this before. Uh, I was, there's a football academy just around the corner from where I live. And strangely enough, the head mistress came and bought a tent off me that I used to use for shooting. And she saw my, uh, my target boss in the garden and my bow was out. And... I went round there to actually see what the ground was like, and then COVID hit us, <laughs> so yeah. we've not we've gone no further. But as soon as we get back, um, she's all all keen for it because all the all all the all they do is football, 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 and badminton. There's nothing else outside, and they've got a fantastic field, ideal for shooting. That'd be great, um, Mandy Elson. Hi, I was just going to um, bring up about what the gentleman before Graham was going on about regarding funding for doing um, the activities in the schools. It is really difficult to get funding to do something that is going to be in a school. However, if you go through your club and set it up as your club to get funding, go to your local sports councils and your active for today councils because they are handing out right now quite substantial amounts of money to get the age bracket of 11 to 16 year olds back into sport and they're very very keen to get archery on the map as well and if you've got a good contact with your local sports council or active um the active group which we have here in the midlands you will be able to get a substantial amount of money to be able to buy all the kit and all the bows and all the arrows and everything to do it so just putting that out there for some of you to actually look at yeah i think there are some funding opportunities maybe this is we could set up a little discussion group on learning curve so that we, everybody could share some of those ideas and uh and, and where to, where to go about that and you, another play is look at who's been successful i know that uh, deer park archers tends to do a lot anybody from deer park here they they've got quite a good program going where they're hitting a lot of schools around in the area um so so i think it is something that can be done let's see i've got uh oh ben is your hand still up or did you have something else yeah yeah, it's actually Nikki. We're sharing a laptop because it's silly okay. having two going. Um, going back to getting the archery on the, the school GCSE curriculum, 
is a way in encouraging more schools to put it in their school games because I know a lot of um, boroughs and councils have an inter school almost like a mini Olympic style thing and I so the was same asked a few months ago well probably a couple of years now about um, archery being involved in that is pushing that harder perhaps a way in perhaps that St Gail can add to her list could be I know Shropshire did my daughter did the uh school games archery but she, they were using the arrows kits a little section yeah kit. i think for the primaries they do use the, the arrow kits or encourage the arrow kits so it was secondaries that i was asked to go and have a look at well and, and luckily she won too because it would have been embarrassing <laughs> for the olympic coach's daughter not to win the archery competition and she doesn't really she's not an archer but at least she <laughs> maybe saw enough of it uh graham did you have something else because your hand is up or you put your hand down no, I think put my hand down, but um, no, I'll put my hand down now. <laughs> you see, was there? Um, oh yeah, you, somebody asked about if RGGB could do a specific module on coaching juniors specifically. Um, yeah, I think when we get into the program coach uh, module, that that third level, that we'll definitely have modules on coaching uh, juniors because uh, I would like to see more coaches. Um, kind of specialize in that or even get archery gb to do more a lot more with the junior program or junior development type program um because i think i think we're we're missing out on a big big chunk of our audience there um so yeah i'm also thinking of maybe doing some coaches courses for for young people to get some because we do have some some sometimes 15 16 17 year olds that are taking our coaching courses but they're mixed in with a lot of others where I think I think we might encourage more kids to get into coaching our young people to get into coaching if uh, if we have courses designed or uh, specifically for uh, young people. I think that could be interesting. Hi there, Lloyd. Lloyd? Yeah. Yeah. So that was my question, actually, because um, it's it's can be quite difficult, um, you know, in your club when you've got some juniors and you haven't got very experienced coaches uh, yeah. because for example like a junior who's say 11 years old um, they can't keep their head up they have to tilt their head because it's not long enough etc etc um, you know so it's all of the the, the bits and bobs um, the the nuts and bolts that you need um, in order to not allow them to get um, you know, fed up because they're not actually progressing any. And obviously, um, with the uh, maturation, they go through lots of um, ups and downs, um, and also, you know, the growth spurts, etc. Um, it can be very difficult, and there isn't a lot of information on um, coaching juniors for AGB. There are um, quite a lot of uh, material out there if you search for it. Um, so pathways like pillars, uh, I think there's a four pillar um, uh, documentation out there somewhere where, you know, uh, pillar one will be, it's more about motor skills and things like that, um, getting them um, active and understanding uh, proprioception, that type of thing, um, and then working their way up because it is quite a responsibility to have juniors and not to lose them really and it's the way you develop them um, at grassroots that you know they end up in the academy and they're on thereafter so um I, i'm fine I, I do find it a bit of a struggle to uh to find things um out there to help me as a coach as a level two coach to progress juniors yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, I think because of our modular approach, you could even stick with being a level two coach, but still take the module on um, junior development or coaching juniors. So, yeah, I think you know that is something we will have in the future. It is in our in our plan and something I look forward to getting into eventually. I've got some hands up, but it it just says plus twenty seven with a big hand, so I don't even know who that is. Do you? Does anybody else have their hand up? Just turn on, turn your mic. Lloyd, I have my hand up. It's still up. Okay. Um, I was just going to reiterate what you said about um, 
junior coaches because one of the juniors that I coach, he was he suffers with nonverbal Tourette's and a few other different disabilities. Um, and he's now going on to college and he wants to be a PE teacher. And he's got such empathy with other children that that has suffered with the same problems as himself. He's a really good archer and he now goes out to schools and talks about how he's conquered his disability and how archery has helped him. And if we can encourage more children that are thinking of coaching to, to do that, I think it's going to massively help the younger people because they're seeing somebody nearer their own age, but also somebody that has suffered the same problems that they have and conquered them. And I think with them being closer in age that, than maybe ourselves, the kids definitely listen a lot more um, and are a lot more inspired, I found, by, by what he has to say and his experiences. And I think if we could build some kind of junior coaching and encourage that more, I think it could only help for sure. Um, because I've got one little lad who's severely dyslexic and I've had him two years now. Now, when I had him, he couldn't even talk to me. All he could do was shrug his shoulders. But by bringing in the other junior and just working with him, I now can't shut him up. That's two years in. So it's worked. And initially I just had to do, I did a sheet for him with emojis on because he doesn't know how to communicate. And I just used to give it to him and he'd tick the emojis on how he felt after the session. So it'd be happy or sad or good or thumbs up. And now, as I say, he can't shut up. So he's really progressed. And I think the opportunities to involve juniors that have been through the same thing, I think it's it's so good. If we could do that, I think it would be awesome. Yeah. I also figure the young people have a better future than the old ones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a longer future. Yeah. <laughs> Be just good for the organization. Yeah, it? exactly so. <laughs> okay, let's see. Anybody else have their hand up? Yep, I've got my hand up, Lloyd. What? It's Ben. Oh, yeah. That's all yours. Just, just the thing with our juniors. The, the major thing we've found with our juniors was having a younger level one working with them. So I've had my son at 17 do a level one course. He's taken all the juniors under his wing. One big thing we do with him is we try and get them all to the junior indoor nationals every year to give them actually something to work towards. Because even if they, they're they not in, com in competitive spirit, it gives them that, that goal to attain. I've done this. This is what I've done. And then, unless you give your juniors that goal, they've got nothing to, nothing to shoot for. And without those juniors, we haven't got a sport. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, I come from the United States. We had, you know, the Junior Olympic Archery Development Program, JOAD, which has been around for years and years and years. And um, there's actually more junior clubs, far, far, far more junior clubs in the United States than there are adult clubs. In fact, there's very few adult clubs, um, although a lot of the adults are, are members of, of the junior clubs. Um, but I think that's... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's it's fun. I think there there are a lot of adult coaches out there that would like working with juniors and junior um, development. It is a lot of fun. Um, and then and I think one of the things that's really nice when you get that, a group of kids together in a club, then they have a much more of a sense of belonging rather than being maybe the only kid with a, with a bunch of adults in a in a group or in a club. But I think it'd be good for our sport for the well development in the future as well as. Um, even even for for, for uh, performance as well, but uh, yeah, I think getting thinking about more involvement of the of the young people and how we can uh, do more with them is is good and important for our sport. It's really almost, it's really energizing, Lloyd, to see the kids come through and start beating the seniors. That's amazing because well, yeah. it just pushes the level up it's beyond belief. Uh, there's another that hand up, good. but I get I get a raised hand and it says. 28 people uh, so i don't know who who's raising their hand i don't know how to figure out how to work that who else has their hand raised here lloyd if you go to the members the, the um hi, the participants who's in here yeah if you go down you'll find the person with their hand up is gary carr because it will show on that list with the person with their hand up gary carr are you there gary 
talk to us. Gary. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good. Um, basically, there was a couple of things you were talking about. One of them was the um, getting kids involved. When I was a, long, a junior many, many years ago, we, to get through to second class, first class, we had to do additional things like uh, making strings and uh, knocking arrows and, you know, fletching arrows, all that kind of stuff to actually get the, and that you then get a certificate to actually show that you'd actually done that process. Um, as part of your training to go to a um, second class or a first class or, or above. I've still got the certificates at home somewhere. They don't do those anymore? Or no, I haven't seen them for years, but we're talking about when I was 13, and that was many, many years ago. As you know, I've been in this sport a long time. Yeah. It's interesting the Joe Ed program in the U.S. is really based around – uh, just eight levels of achievement, which is score only, and there's there's nothing else around it. And many times they've talked about adding other skills like learning the crafts and stuff, but they've never done that. Um, no, but it it would it it would be kind of nice if they were it's like the, the second thing. they have a few more, you know, learn a little bit more about the sport. Yeah, the, the second thing I wanted to ask was, um, have we got any costings yet for doing a senior course? Uh, the senior coaches, I just heard kind of a, a ballpark there looking at around a thousand pounds. Okay. And a lot of that will be online, I'm assuming, at the moment. Yeah, we'll be coming out of this lockdown pretty soon. But I think it'd be better online because you have people from all over the country and you're not you're not going to want to travel all over <laughs> it could be a far for some people somebody asked about uh what the cost of the last part of the the level one so the level one session course right now we're doing basically the equivalent of two days online those are that's it's 100 pounds if you take all four because 25 pounds per module so we don't know what the other part's going to be yet i think it'll be variable depending on um you know the the coach developer and their whatever their expense are going to be to get to the location uh, you know, how far away and then the cost of the facilities um you know if there's a, a cost there so i think i think they'll have be variable in price depending on um on what the costs are going to be okay i'm just running through the chat see if there's any more questions we only got a couple minutes left here um if you all think about you know topics you want to go over if there's parts of shooting technique i was going to talk about just a couple things that i've had this past week about an archer hitting their bow arm and then and kind of a, a ginch in the bow arm but um i i do want to talk a little bit more about when if that's if that's what interests y'all i think i'll put together some photographs maybe for next time to talk about things i'm just looking through the the chat um i'll i'll see if i can save this chat and maybe we can send it out to people as well we did this meeting is is recorded so it'll be available if if uh you, you anybody that has missed it that you want to share it with um that's good does anybody have any other questions It's good to see coaches if we've got i don't know how many coaches we have 1500 to 2000 but we got 40 of them here anyway my, so these my, are you know, i did put out uh, an email a few days before with a topic yeah so we could all think about it and get our views together yeah can we do a, can we do a session on equipment equipment question and answers would be really useful yeah yeah i can show you some of my high speed videos and stuff get you really thinking about what happens? Are you thinking about specific manufacturers or, or well, equipment tuning setup and selection? Or? Just general questions about equipment setup okay. and different. Um, I was actually thinking specifically about arrows at the minute because of them taking out the ACC and the ACG. It'd be useful to bounce off ideas on what we're going to fill that gap with, particularly for the juniors that are shooting better. Yeah. So something like that would be really useful. 
I did work at Easton for 20 years. So. Yeah, <laughs> so you might know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know something about arrows. I don't know, it's been a long time though, so. But that would be really helpful. Things keep changing. Yeah, we could even get somebody to come on and talk with you. It's from Easton. Yeah, that would be cool. Fun. I'd probably do that. Um, probably get Doug from Hoyt. Yeah, it'd be uh, really interesting. If we could do something like that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely do do things like that on equipment or other subjects. Yeah, anything you guys want to do. I think I I mentioned before, you know, we do these other we if you want to put together some a specific um you know workshop or discussion with with different people, if there's anybody you want to hear from or uh, um or different topics, we could try to put something together as well. So we are trying to offer as much as we can. People are getting kind of used to these these online things so maybe they're not so bad but then I, somebody said now people are starting to get burned out on them so they're not going to want to do them anymore they're getting tired of it so i don't know i think there's there's some definitely advantages to it but then there's some, some drawbacks too well there's more contact between agb and the and the archery community doing it this way which so many people have complained that there wasn't before <laughs> yeah i think we had what they say this past month we had 58 evenings of seminars or, yeah. or, or yeah. workshops online stuff i mean there's there's a whole lot of i mean i've i've been thursdays tend to be been a couple thursdays in a row where i've had three different calls i was supposed to be on and uh i, I bounce back and forth between them trying to keep up but yeah we're you know we're, we're we are trying to do things for the members so we're all in lockdown together, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be nice to be out of it soon. Okay, anything else you all want to talk about? Or any other questions before we, before we say goodnight? It was good seeing you all. And you can always email me or if you if you want to chat, we can uh, we can set up a little chat thing. I, I've got uh, I've got time most of the time. <laughs> Okay. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay uh, safe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye. You. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, Lord. Bye. 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 Cheers, everyone. Anybody know how to save the chat? I want to save the chat. Good night, Lloyd. Thanks very much. Good night. And I will I will email you tomorrow at some point or the day after. <laughs> uh, there's, okay. a, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you via email. So we'll speak later. Okay. Thanks for tonight. Bye-bye. Okay. See you.